so, so today you can get quite philosophical about it. It's about the interaction of the discrete with the continuous. So I hear lots of people saying, I love discrete stuff and other people saying, I like continuous things. And so I thought I would like to put together a bit of a lecture that kind of has my own feelings about the discrete versus the continuous. So I'm not sure I have that many Julia concepts in this lecture. Maybe as I go through, I'll find that I really do and I'll add a few of those. Uh, we do have some very fancy HTML and CSS type printing. The truth is when it comes to CSS and HTML and formatting, I really don't know anything about that. But uh, what I do is slack over to Fonz, the inventor of Pluto, and he knows all the fancy ways of doing things. And if you want to try to figure out how that works, great. Uh, otherwise, you could just use it like I do. But I do have um, the, the it, I mean, I think this talk is, this particular lecture is really about the, the pedagogical ideas. Uh, one of which is, of course, that uh, it, is that these kinds of, of Pluto lectures let you do curiosity-based learning. And in particular, this lecture, what I'd like to do is talk about bridging what is all too often two different communities. So if I'm gonna talk about discrete and continuous, let me try to at least give some sort of definition of discrete and continuous. In fact, without very advanced math, it's kind of hard to describe discrete and continuous. And so more often than not, what you do is just sort of define it by example. So perhaps probably people are familiar. When one talks about discrete math objects, one thinks of things like finite sets, like here, here's the sequence going from one through 100. Uh, or infinite discrete sets like the integers. Uh, I, I don't think that the rational numbers counts as discrete math. It's, it's, some people may know that it's countable. There, in a certain sense, there are as many rational numbers as there are integers, um, but they're not separated. And so I think the rational numbers are not discrete. Maybe one can argue about that. And so here, what I've done is I grabbed the Julia package that draws random graphs just because I wanted a picture of graphs. And I started to grab a pic one picture off the internet and I thought, oh, that's not so much fun. And so Dave told me about this particular package. So this is a graph of a random social network. And I'll tell you, it's even harder to talk about continuous, a picture to, to show continuous math. This one I did take off the internet. I kind of liked it. There's a real number line. And I like the way they very colorfully took different kinds of numbers, like pi is a transcendental number with integers, right? The square root of three is, is a algebraic number, right? X squared minus three equals zero has this as a root, but it's not a rational number. Uh, the other three numbers are rational here. This one's a repeating fraction with the bar over it. Uh, here is one that's expressed as a decimal, expressed as a fraction. So uh, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to def define continuous, but hopefully many of you recognize that uh, it, when you take limits, when you have sort of entire intervals, when you have surfaces, these, these correspond to the continuous. And um, I hear this all the time as a professor. You know, some students will tell me, I only like discrete math. And others will say, I only like continuous math, right? And I hear that a lot. I, I hear that from students. I hear it from professors, believe it or not. Uh, and it's definitely not unusual. And here, I'll just sort of move this up and Dave will probably say to make it bigger. Um, you know, it's really not unusual to gravitate towards the discrete or the continuous. Um, but what I would like to, to say is, uh, I, is, is a number of things. First of all, uh, the discrete and continuous, I think we're always blurred, but I think more so now than ever that, uh, for those in say computer science and other discrete areas, machine learning has become very, very popular as you all know. And all of a sudden continuous optimization, uh, derivatives, gradients, the, the, I've never heard, I, I hardly ever heard the word gradient being used in the, in, the, in the hallways where computer scientists lived until the last couple of years. So, so continuous math is finding its way into computer science through, through machine learning. Uh, maybe it's always been there in signal processing anyway, but but maybe more so now. Uh, data science and statistics also have become very, very popular these days, and that has a lot of continuous ideas. So 
maybe it was always true, uh, but I think more than ever that continuous math is is finding its way in places where discrete math was was always used. Oh, and I just caught a typo, and since I can fix it, I will. Um, if I could find it quickly again, here. Let's see, mtix. Can I find it? I fix. I'll fix it on. So if this was a blackboard, I would erase or stick it in. But here, no. Oh, if I can, can I do this quickly? There we go. All right. Spelling error fixed. Um, so, but let me say two more things about uh, continuous math, and, and that 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 uh, you may have never thought about. Maybe you have. Maybe you haven't. But uh, if you have, if if you have a very very large discrete object, uh, it's it's usually valuable to turn it into a continuous object. It, it often, a, a very very large discrete object. Sometimes, often, maybe not always, it it wants to be a continuous object. And when you turn it into a continuous object, it, it's it's often simpler. You you keep the sort of the good part, the thing that's really happening, and you kind of remove the unnecessary details that a a large discrete system would have. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I've seen people make, you know, uh, models with thousands and thousands of states. And it just became clear that the continuous version is just so much easier to work with. So, so my one point is continuous math can be simpler than discrete math. And I'll give you some examples of that. And, uh, and maybe an even more important example is, is this message right here that the combination of continuous and discrete is probably way more useful than either one alone. And this often surprises people, uh, but it can be much more useful if you can think in both ways. And so in this course, we would like to encourage you to do so if you're not already doing that. And finally, when it comes to applications, uh, machine learning I already mentioned, but you know, epidemics, is climate change, uh, it just shows how important continuous math is these days. Uh, we're all affected by our physical world, of course. Um, the epidemics of, of you know, pandemics, maybe, or should I say pandemics? I'll change this to pandemics, then I'll check it in later. So pandemics, climate change, we, we're also affected by the, the physical world, which is very, very often continuous. Okay, so now to move on to some details. So let me start in, in sort of comparing the, the discrete and, and the continuous and how they might work together by a very simple example, indexing and function evaluation. I'd like to consider these two at the same time, right? So the idea that I'm thinking about is I've got a vector V and I'm pulling out the ith element, right? So very often if I have a vector V in math, I would write it as V sub I if I wanted the ith element and a function like a function machine, right? Like, you know, you've all, yeah, let's see if we can get some pictures of function machines. So, oh, there's a cool function machine. Yeah, so you can find these by yourself, but here, here's a function machine that uh, in, has inputs and outputs, right? So you all know about function machines. So, you know, I, I think of these as very different. Uh, it, it, maybe it's sort of psychological, but uh, I don't think of V sub I as a function of I. I just think of it as, as grab the ith element. I mean, maybe it's just the way my brain works. It's just, oh, like I've got them all in a row, you know, V sub five is the fifth one of these, just grab it, right? Well, when I think of F of X, I think of more like a function machine, like evaluate the sine of X or the square root of X, you know, or, or some more complicated function. I think of a process as opposed to sort of picking out an element, right? So, uh, of course, a moment's thought tells you that a vector is just a discrete function. I mean, it's not a hard concept, but I wonder how often people think about the fact that a vector is really a discrete function and that the argument is simply taking the values one through N and the evaluation is V sub I, right? And so uh, the input to the function machine is a number like five and the output is V of five, right? It's, it's a function, right? Just like, like this continuous function might be, right? So uh, let's think about this a little bit more with code. So for example, suppose I had the numbers two through 20 in a vector, right? And so here, maybe this is a little bit of Julia because I'm, I'm using the semicolon as we've seen in one of the homeworks to, to expand the range into the actual vector of length 10, two through 20. So here we have this vector two through 20. Uh, 
Uh, of course, if I use square bracket of seven, this is going to extract an element from memory, kind of like my, my it, it's kind of like my psychological view of picking out the seventh element, right? I'll get that 14 out because it's picking it out. Of course, there's probably some address calculation deep inside the computer. And so there's, there's actually a function that's happening, but on the surface level, this feels like picking out the seventh element, right? We're indexing into a vector. We're really just picking out the seventh element, okay? Uh, however, if I actually index into a range object itself, and you'll remember that uh, the difference is, this really is the vector that you see above. It's, it's the vector of length 10. This is just three numbers. It's, it's a beginning number two, a step size of two, and an ending number of 20, right? So there's only three numbers in the computer. So when I evaluate seven here, more or less what's going on is I am calculating two, I originally had four. I am calculating two times seven. So, so this is a function evaluation in every sense of the word. I am, I've got the function which takes i to two i, and that calculation is happening right in Julia. It is a function. Now, you might think I'm belaboring the point, perhaps I am, but I really want you to think about the fact that, that, that uh, this is as much of a function as if I actually implemented the 2x function directly. Um, of course, this function only applies on the range of numbers from one through 10, right? If I try to apply it to 11, I'll be sorry, right? Because it, 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 I've got that bounds error, right? And I certainly can't apply it to pi. Right, it's like that's an invalid index, right? But if I take any of the numbers from one through ten, that is the domain of my function, and it works so works fine. Okay, uh, as opposed to this function, where actually I could calculate, of course, f of I could actually take f of pi and so forth. All right, so any which way, v is a function input um, function machine. All right, let me move on. Maybe that was kind of one sort of discrete continuous. Let, let's talk a little bit about area. Okay, so the, the, let's talk about the area of a circle using regular polygons. Okay, and so I, I had fun putting this together. I have a, 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 I have a unit circle here whose area is pi, right? This is pi r squared, pi times one squared. The area is pi. And I'm going to, to go through and, uh, well, let's go back to three. So, and I'm going to do the usual thing that probably many of you have seen this in high school as well. Um, I'm going to represent it. I'm going to try to calculate the area by inscribing a polygon. I could have also circumscribed it, but I'm just gonna do the inscribed polygon. So I could take three to get a triangle, four makes a square. Uh, here's the exact area. This, I think of this as, as a discrete area, like a discrete approximation uh, to the area, right? And somehow the limiting thing is the continuous circle. So here's a six gone, a seven gone, um, an octagon, like a stop sign, a nanogon, decagon, there's a dodecagon. I don't know the, the fancy prefixes beyond that. But you know, it's kind of fun to see the limiting process. You know, we can go all the way here. I've got this little pinwheel thing going on. Here's a hundred. You know, here at once I've inscribed a hundred gone, I mean, I guess to the human eye, it looks like it's fully over the circle, but you see that it's only the three decimal places at 100 even, it's 0.999, okay, pi, right? That's the, the result. So uh, so if you try to sort of do this with 100 gone, you know, 100 gone and try to get it, you know, you don't, you certainly don't have full precision on, on a computer. You, you get three digits though. So, uh, so, so when you th see things like this, you tend to think of the continuous limit as far away, right? Like, Infinity feels like it's a long distance away, right? It's gonna, it's gonna take a long time to get to infinity, right? Like forever, right? So, so when you think of the notion of limits and, and, and you know, and the number of sides going to infinity, I mean, just, you know, I, I, again, this is sort of how my mind works. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but I, tend to, I, I think of infinity as, as far away, right? It's, it's not nearby. And so you might be surprised to find out that uh, sometimes infinity is not nearly as far away as you might think. And so I'm gonna show you something that I think is a lot of fun. I'm going to define an area function that takes in the number of sides. And you might've already kind of seen the pattern up here, right? When S was hundred, the area was hundred over two times sine of two pi over hundred. So this is sort of an exact formula. I mean, we, 
we, we've, we've got computers, we can evaluate the area of this 100 gun. And so here's a, an area function. And what I'd like to do is evaluate this for um, starting with a square and working my way up to two to the 10th, right? That would be 1,024 gone and see how close to pi we get, right? And again, it's kind of a little disappointing. Many of you will know that pi is 3.14159. And so even with inscribing 1,024 uh, uh, polygon into a circle, you're, you're not even getting that, you know, enough digits that are revealed here. All right, well, like I said, 1,024 is not infinity. You have to go a little bit further, right? Well, wrong in a way. And this is, I'd like to show you a carefully chosen convolution of the numbers we had. So convolutions are showing up everywhere. So let, let's do some more convolutions, okay? So here I had area zero, and let me remind you, zero means, I mean, I could have written this as a function, but I just decided that this will be the zero step of, of an analysis that I'm about to do. So area zero is, just to remind you, it's the area of polygons with sides, with number of sides, let's, you know, with numbers, with, with number of sides equals, and we're starting with a square and we're going all the way to two to the 10th, which is 1,024, okay? By the way, I always encourage everybody to learn all the powers of two up to 16. So comes in handy, you'd be surprised. Should I, should I, quick side story. When I was a graduate student, this was a long time ago, um, somebody called up, uh, I was a graduate student in the math department though, in, in, over in, in what's called building two at MIT in the basement. And I got, I answered the phone and somebody said, can I talk to somebody? I'd like to talk to, to anybody who knows a little bit about probability. So I had, you know, it was a very strange phone call. I, I took it and said, we're lawyers. We'd like to hire you to testify in court. What is the probability of two or three coin tosses, you know, coming up heads? I said, oh, I could do that. That sounded like fun. Uh, so I went into court and they asked me, what is the probability of 16 coins all coming up heads, right? And I just happened to know the number 65536 for various reasons. And I just shouted it out and the lawyers were very impressed as if I had calculated in my head at that moment. So I would absolutely encourage people to learn powers of two. So here I'm taking the powers of two, the nine powers of two starting at two and ending at 10, right? So the, the square all the way to the one of 24 gone, okay? And now what I'm going to do and I'll explain why this works later, or maybe you can figure it out for yourselves, is I'm going to do a convolution. What I'm going to do is literally, uh, let, let's see if I could draw this on the screen. So I'm gonna take as an example, you know, let's, let's do this one. Um, I'm going to take four thirds of say this one, I mean, the, with all convolutions, this will be a sliding window. And I'm gonna subtract one third of this one, right? And I'm not only gonna do that here, but I'm going to take advantage of my scroll to show you that I'm gonna do it here as well. I'm gonna do it here as well. I'm gonna do it here and here. See, this is a convolution, right? Here I am taking advantage of my medium that this stays over there, right? So I'm gonna do this for every pair of consecutive numbers, okay? So I can kill my convolution. And I just did that. I mean, there are a lot of ways I could have done it. I did it uh, here with uh, a comprehension. Okay, and when I do that, okay, oh, look at that. I've got a lot more digits, 3.14159. So that's kind of cool that somehow there's a, there's more digits of pi hidden in these, in these numbers, but you can't get there as quickly by, you, you can't get to infinity, but the numbers are there. You just have to know this convolution is somehow exposing something that was there. How's that for a fun surprise? Okay, and so here's a little function that Fonz gave me, and uh, this is color good bad, which actually, what it'll do is it'll take the first number, which is the test, you know, the, the pi, and another number, which is an approximation, and it will uh, have the good digits in black and the bad digits in red, right? So that's kind of fun. And so here, let me, let's see, oh, did I not, uh, I'm gonna show you this in a minute, but, all right, here, let's hold off on that a second. So anyway, here's, 
here's the game I'm playing. Uh, what happened? Just uh, hold on a second. You know what? Here, let me let me let me show you the final answer. It's more fun, and then I'll show you how I got there. Okay, so this here, this first column is the set of numbers that represent the areas of these polygons. This was the area of the square. This is the octagon. This is the 16 gon, the 32 gon, and so forth. This column here represents exactly the, the and here I'll put it back with my little, uh, with, with my, this is exactly the one where we take four thirds of this with a convolution and minus one third of this. And you'll note that Look at all the digits of pi that we get, okay, just by doing this little trick. How cool is that? Okay. And you can see that if you do this, if you do sort of the ordinary thing, you can kind of see this linear path, right? And here you see a linear path, but it's with a steeper slope, right? Oh, that's sort of interesting, okay? Well, if this is a good idea, then maybe it's a good idea to do it again. And in fact, there's a magic sequence of numbers that lets you do it again. And I think you'll see the pattern fairly quickly. Here I'm going to go minus one fifteenth and minus sixteen fifteenths. Okay, that's uh, it's, it's just above here, and I get even more digits of pi coming out. Look at that! I almost have a full set of digits of pi. How is that possible? I always stopped at a thousand twenty-four. I only had something that was good to five digits. And yet somehow I was able to get all of these digits of pi. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, then I keep on going again. Maybe you can see the pattern. Uh, this, this time I'm at 64. This is the one that's on the screen, right? So I take 64 over 63 of the good one and I subtract one over 63 of the less good one and I get these many digits. And if I could square, clear the screen, you could see that uh, in the end I get all the digits of pi come out, right? If I keep play, if I know the right convolutions to do, all of my digits of pi are pi are there, okay? So this is where my point is that knowing continuous math and discrete math at the same time is somehow more useful than one or the other on its own, right? That how would you know to do that? How would you be able to figure out that all the digits of pi are there, not by going to an infinite limit. An infinite limit would take, you see, the difference is the, the infinite limit, if I, had, if I could sort of give you the idea, you would have to go all the way down this way at this sort of gradual slope, right? Uh, instead, the encouragement is to go this way by using you know, some interesting clear thoughts here. Okay, so let's clear these drawings and um, say some more about, let's tell you why this works, okay? So uh, I'll give you a feel for why this works. So many of you would know the Taylor series for sine. So here's, here's my formula for area as a function of the number of sides S, okay? And it's quite easy. Wait, something's missing. Uh, something is missing. Area, what is it? It's two pi over S, is that the formula? What was it? Let's look back up just to see. What was the formula? S over two times sine two pi over S. S, so do I have that right? It's just the LaTeX there. S over two, yep, this is correct now. Okay, Th this part I know is correct. So this is the area formula. And if you do the Taylor series, uh, so this is, the Taylor series works for S large because Taylor series around zero, right? This is gonna be small. It expands out and basically these are just you know, this is three, three times five, three times five times seven, right? These are just like powers of odd numbers or something. Um, so, you know, the factorial things come in to play. So, so uh, anyway, this is the explicit formula. And you could see that as you double the number of sides, in fact, I kind of expanded it. I got rid of the, I, I rewrote this kind of without the distracting constants. And so the area you could see is pi, you know, minus something over s squared plus something over s to the fourth. Now, when I double the sides, of course, this becomes four s squared, this becomes 16 s to the fourth. And so think about it. Think about what would happen if I took four thirds of these, and I could draw it again here with my little picture, right? Imagine I multiply this by four thirds, if you can, and then I multiply this by minus a third, and I add. 
Well, first of all, the fact that these two numbers add up to one tells me that I'll get pi back as sort of the leading behavior, right? Four thirds of pi minus one third of pi is still pi. But this particular combination will kill the one over s squared term. You see that? If I multiply this by four, I, I kind of kill this, right? And then the fact that then otherwise these are opposite sign kills the entire term. And so all of a sudden I've killed this and I'm now left with something that's the leading behavior after the pi part is s to the minus four now, all right? So that's how this all works, all right? So there, you know, a good magician does tell us his tricks, I don't know. So you see, uh, all of a sudden, if I were to use this combination, if I double the sides, my error more or less goes down, not by four now, but by 16, okay? Well, you could keep playing this game and the part that's important is not the constants. The only part that's important is that this is s to the minus two, s to the minus four, s to the minus six, and you know, s to the minus even numbers, right? If you had all the, all the numbers, not just the evens, you'd make some slightly different choices to make this all work out. But because this was even, the even powers of two, that is the powers of four, are what's relevant, okay? And so that's why you probably, you probably notice the pattern here. I mean, you could look at it almost in the code. Uh, that, you know, I was taking 16 fifteenths minus 115, and then I was taking 64 sixty-thirds minus 1 sixty-third, 128, 127th, right? So the, there's a factor of four going on, right? And then one less. So that's all due to the fact that I have S to the even numbers, okay? And so um, we could do this with Julia using big. I don't know if I need, maybe Dave could tell me if I ever needed the big of two, but I just started, uh, I wanted to see how many digits I could get if I, carry the pi to more decimal places because after all, eventually you've only got 16 digits of pi when you do floating point. And so I want to see what would happen if I carried more digits and you could see, so I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go from two to the first to two to the 16th, okay? And I'm gonna do a big area calculation and I'm just gonna show you the last answer. Okay, so this is the, this is now 60, just to be very clear, I've inscribed 60, uh, 65,000 gone into a circle and I've measured the area and this is what I get. But if I do the four thirds minus one third convolution, look at all the digits I, I get. I mean, this is probably more than floating point accuracy, I think, okay? But I can keep on going. And now look at all the digits I get, right? And I just did it again because I was having so much fun and I got these many digits, okay? And then I went this far. Uh, well, you get the idea. Let's see how far did I get. So this was this is I went up to six five five three six, and you can see that there are these many uh, correct digits. Is that really right? Four one nine seven one six three nine five one zero oh, five. Oh yeah, I just wanted to see it here. Yep. So yeah. So the, I got I got tons and tons of correct digits just by knowing how to sort of basically pull the information out of this limiting sequence, okay? All right, that's one point about areas of circles. Let me make another point about the area of a circle. So I, uh, I, I wrote another program that, that approximated the area of a circle by, you know, let's go down to, by, by basically uh, making, uh, by, by, by basically putting like graph paper around the circle and counting how many squares are say completely inside. There are other ways to do it. You could do that intersect or that, that are not completely outside, but I decided to count the ones inside. Okay, and this is a 2s by 2s square, just to, you know, you know just to mention that uh, what my s is, for whatever reason I made the square, the, the, I made the sort of, the not, this is sort of like a four by four grid, right? So this is a 2s by 2s grid is, is my point. And we could start to see what happens. Uh, here we have a six by six grid. We get about a little more than half pi. Uh, here's an eight by eight grid. The way I did it actually, I mean, I could have, probably could have done a little better, but I just to save drawing lots of squares, I figured out the biggest square that I could inscribe, that's the red one. And then in some sort of dumb way, kind of naive way, I, I found all the little blue squares. Um, and just checked if they were all inside. And you know, you could see that this is heading towards pi, 
right? Uh, one of my favorites is, I think, was it 32? This kind of caught me by surprise. So I'm, I'm still at 30. It's drawing lots and lots of little squares, okay? But at the level of 32, was it 32? Oh, maybe it was 30? There was one answer that surprised me. Maybe it was 30. I'd have to remember now. Let me just see if it's 30. Ah, uh, yes, 30. At the level of 30, the exact area is three. I, I guess there are some engineers who I've heard feel that you know three is a perfectly good uh, value for pi. So at 30, it actually turns out to be exactly three. But here, this speaks a bit to my point that the, the this discrete object, the one where you count squares, is messy. I mean, I think everybody would agree that you know you could do better than what I'm doing now, but it's, it's got some sort of arbitrary detail to it. Like who's exactly on the inside and who is it? It's, it's, it you get these weird numbers, right? It's, it's, I mean, the continuous limit is just gonna be pi, a very simple thing. But as you head to that limit, you get these very, very messy things. And, and that's, that's my point that the, the discrete can be much messier than the, the continuous limit, which is one of the reasons why continuous math has, has some value. But now there's something else I want to say, and I wonder if this will make sense to everybody, but I'm going to try. This one's a little bit more philosophical, or maybe it's a bit more of a sort of how mathematicians do things. But I want you to think a little bit about uh, the two ways I just got area, right? So there's this one up above, you know, where I inscribed, you know, I got this pinwheel, you know, the polygon inside. And this way, and I'm sure you all could imagine other ways I could get area of a circle, right? I mean, I could, I mean, I guess I could do it with my, with my pen here. So uh, maybe I will, right? I mean, I could, I could do a hexagonal tile window. This, this one cut, it won't come out. Uh, let me get it. I need to get a dark color. Um, yeah, let's see, there we go. Yeah, so I could have hexagonal smaller than this, but I, you know, or, Right, or I could have, you know, other weird shape shapes, right? There's nothing that says that it has to be, you know. But anyway, I could cover this with, with other shapes. And we all have this intuition that no matter how you cover it, what kind of shapes, whether you, whether you, whether you have a regular polygon or squares or hexagons, as they get smaller, as the shapes get smaller and you fill up the region, they're all gonna to converge to what we all know as the area, right? We're, I think the concept of area is very intuitive. We, we probably understand the notion of area even when we're fairly young, I suppose. Uh, you know, you know uh, how much paint you need to paint something or I don't know how we get the notion of area, but one way or another, we probably have the notion of area from when we're, we're very young. But I would like you to, for a moment, to delete that if possible. Imagine you didn't have an intuition about area. All right, can you do that for a moment for me? I mean, maybe it's not so easy because it's so rooted in our experience. But I would like you to forget that you ever knew anything about area, okay? I want you to be like, you know, you're smart, inquisitive people, but you never learned about area, right? Just never, you, it didn't happen. You, you didn't see area in the real world, okay? If you could do that for me, then I would like you to ask the question, well, how do I know these different things will converge to the same number. It's, you see, without intuition for area, you know, it's not logically required. I mean, I know we're so used to area, it's hard to believe, but if you think about the logic, it is not logically required a priori that all of these different approaches to measuring the area discreetly will somehow converge to the same answer. Is it, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm so used to the, that it will, I, I have to really push it out of my mind. No, it's not obvious. Maybe you get a different answer if you used hexagons versus squares or triangles, right? You know, little, 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 maybe little triangles would give me a little more than pi. I mean, I don't know, right? It, it's not, I mean, just think about it. It is not at all, you know, mathematics lives in its own logical universe, right? It's not about painting. It, it's not how much paint you need. It's, it's a mathematical question. Can this, do these all have the same answer? And of course, people, you know, mathematicians have rigorized this and they have proved uh, using techniques from something called analysis 
that that they do all have the same answer, right? And you see, here's the big point of all. When you have a whole bunch of limiting processes that give you the same answer, no matter how you get there, right? It didn't matter whether you use squares or triangles. If all of these different ways of getting there give you the same answer, then this thing is an object. This thing is a mathematical object and it deserves a name. Like it deserves to be called area, right? And so this happens a lot in math where discrete things, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how you discretize, but when you go to the limit, you will get the same answer. And mathematicians then say, this thing has a name, it exists. It deserves, you know, area exists, okay? So uh, I would like to bring this up now in the context of the random walks that we've been talking about. So if I may move on. So I, I would like to remind you here, let's get rid of, let's get rid of the, the, the writing that I've done. Let me the, show you the, some, the, you know, a beautiful plot that Dave showed in Monday's lecture. Let me remind you that uh, he showed this picture of what one might call the binomial distribution. I mean, this is really just a, a this is really just a, a, a kind of rendering of a normalized Pascal's triangle. And let me kind of remind you quickly what, what he showed you, if maybe you weren't there, or, but let me remind you what this is all about. Uh, Pascal's triangle, here, I could just sort of write it out over here. You know. right, so here are some of the first couple of rows of Pascal's triangle. And uh, the way this is rendered is here's one, right? And the, if, if you sum across the rows, right, you get powers of two, right? So I think everybody knows that. That's like one plus one to the end, right? So what we're gonna do is normalize it to have area one. So what's plotted here is a half a half. Right, and then what's plotted here is at the height one quarter, one half, one quarter, right? And what's plotted here is like one eighth and three eighths, right? That's the purple, three eighths and one eighth, right? And so this is really a rendering of Pascal's triangle. It's, it's, it's not much more than that. Now, we also interpreted these, but as a picture, this is just Pascal's triangle. There's nothing more, there's no probability it, uh, the, you don't need to bring up probability, right? It's just Pascal's triangle, a very discrete object, I should say, right? I mean, Pascal's triangle is often taught in, in high schools or even earlier, and it's, you know, it's, you could just build it by just adding numbers, right? Adding, adding small integers. And so everybody could play with Pascal's triangle. It doesn't require special knowledge, okay? Uh, but we also interpreted this as probabilities, right? That this, this and I'll, I'll, I'll remind you here, I actually, switch this over to Plotly, but, uh, oh, I don't know, depending on the view, this is actually almost harder to look at than, than the, at one point I, I like moving these things around, but to get just the good view can be tricky. I've gotten a good view before. But anyway, I think you could see that, uh, you might remember that we had this random walk, and here, let me just sort of try to emphasize it with my, Right, can you see the random walk? I'll try to sort of emphasize it. These dots got too big, but anyway, there's a random walk. I'll overemphasize it with my squiggly. Uh, that the random walk, there's this random discrete object, which is a random walk, right? Here's one instance of, one instantiation, if you will, one instance of this random walk. And I'll remind you that if you, if to an observer sitting at, at one place, let's say somebody sitting at 10, which is this red place right here, right? To an observer sitting at 10 and uh, asking, where, you know, so, so, uh, you know, what, this is time equals 10, by the way. An observer, so I guess it, it, maybe I shouldn't say an observer sitting there, but somebody who's only taking measurements at time 10 might be a better way to say it. Uh, and you see, where is this random walker in his random walk, right? He's going up and down and up and down, right? And at time equals 10, right? somebody's noting where it is, and then I'll remind you, these are the probabilities of landing at various different points in space. Okay, so that's what this curve, this is what this three-dimensional plot was doing. It's, it's basically saying that your probability of, of being, you know, something like the 10th row of Pascal's triangle is, those are the probabilities, right? The, the probability of being at i is, is going to be something like, you know, the binomial coefficient 10 choose i or 9, I don't know if it's zero based or one based, but something like that. Okay, so, Let's talk about the continuous now, uh, because this kind of can blow your mind. 
right? So there is the concept of a continuous object called uh, a, a continuous random walk. But let, let's, let's go slowly just to make sure that, uh, maybe we'll focus on the red at first. Yeah, let's, let's do, uh, yeah, let's, let's focus on the red. This red here is a random walk, but instead of taking a, instead of flipping a coin and going left or, and right with probability a half, what I'm going to do is at every step, I'm going to take a normal distribution with just a little bit of variance that it's so that the amount of, of variance corresponds exactly to the, to the random walk where I'm doing the Bernoulli, right? And so the red shows sort of a, a kind of discrete random walk. And what I can do with my little slider, I think I have to make this smaller so you could see it, is of course, here, let's go ahead. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Let me see if I can make this point clearly. I'm trying to make my, oh, now, it, now it'll do it. Now too many. All right, let's try that again. Here we go. Actually, what else? let's move the slider. Ah. I'm supposed to be able to grab the slider and move it. Where'd it go? I moved it. Where'd it go? Oh no. Where did my slider go? It went all the way up. There the ah, we go. I got it. My, my slider went. All right, fine. Let's just leave it here. Sometimes it's hard to just grab it and put it where you want. So yeah, let's let, let me first just focus on the red. Okay. Here's a random walk that just takes two steps, right? I'm going to, my first step is, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so the horizontal axis here is time. Maybe I should actually, let's, let's actually label that so there's no confusion. X label time. And my Y label is position. That's where I'm going to end up, right? So let's label it so there's no doubt about where things are. And uh, I want time to simply go from zero to one. That seems to be a convenient normalization. And this says that at time a half, you know, I've managed to move up a little bit. It's just gonna be a normal, uh, I'll say exactly what normal distribution is, what variance, but I, I generate a normal random variable and it goes to here and then it goes to here. Now what I could do is uh, kind of, do what I was doing with the polygons. I could sort of double the, the number of time steps, right? Now I could take four steps and here you could see sort of a random walk with four steps, okay? Uh, I can go a little further. Uh, here I'm actually taking, what am I taking? I think I'm taking six steps, right? Or, uh, or, or is it two to the fifth? I've already forgotten. No, it's two to the fifth. It's just like the polygons. There's two steps, four steps, eight steps. Yeah, I'm, I'm doubling every time, right? And so you see, I make, I'm, I'm going, I'm taking smaller steps in smaller time and there's a limit to this thing, okay? And this is what's called Brownian motion, okay? And the, notice that this, this, this discrete object the, at four, the, the red, this discrete object uh, is, is, is a function that takes on discrete times, right? Like here, let's, let's just go to the beginning here, right? So this is like my V sub I that I started with, right? I can evaluate this function at zero and a half and one. Now, I drew the linear interpolant because it's fun to do that. Uh, I didn't really have to, but, um, but really this is zero, a half and one. It's really a discrete function. I mean, maybe you would have even preferred if I actually went ahead and um, didn't draw the yeah, maybe we'll, is that gonna work? No, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Uh, Dave, tell me. Um, and what happened? I don't, oh, oh, my dots are too small. That's my, no, I want to, no, no, it worked. I just didn't see that it worked. Okay, yeah. So this is a function, I think it looks better this way. This is a function that takes on only the value zero, a half and one, right? And then. When I do this, I've got a function that's zero, a quarter, one half, three quarters, and one. And each one of these, you see, I know it looks like I'm just looking at the value of this, of this continuous function at those points, but really as a random variable, this is just a normal distribution, okay? It is 
I can go all the way from zero to a quarter by just generating a normal random variable, okay? And then of course I'm filling in more dots and I get, right, I, I get what ultimately in the limit would be the continuous Brownian motion, okay? Of course I could do this again. My point is that if you, if you follow the middle dot, if you follow that middle dot as I do this, this is a normal distribution, okay? And I didn't have to generate the big blue curve first, right? I just wanted to match it up. Uh, but if I was only interested in the statistics at time and a half, right, I would just draw that normal distribution. And in fact, if you look at the code that I'm doing to actually uh, do this sort of thing, it actually, where is it? Oh, I don't know where it is. Uh, but it, it, it basically does, I think I did it later. Uh, well, it basically what it's doing is it's making a step size of one over N, okay? But the uh, variance is what has to be proportional to the time. So, so let me, I'm saying too much. Let me kind of slow down a little bit and say this, that, uh, yeah, let me, let's, let, me, let me kind of emphasize the key points that I'd like you all to walk away with. Okay, so let's, come on. Why can't I? My, uh, I seem to be unable to move my mouse. Is that, let me just see why that is. Is that Zoom? Let me just see if I can type one plus one. I'm always happy. Oh, yes. Always happy when Julie does that. Oh, now it's working. Okay. Yeah, let's let's go to the level of like 16 dots or something. Okay. So so my point number one is I can generate this by taking uh, normal random variables. My next question is which normal random variables? The answer is at every step it's going to be mean zero and variance one sixteenth. Okay. So that when I get to the end here, the variance will be one, which is kind of a nice normalization. So Basically, what's happening as I, as I, uh, as I generate new instances, as I generate new instances, as you've seen before, that the dot over here whips around the least, right? Its variance is one sixteenth. The thing over here has got a much more variance, right? It's going to be one half, right? So the one in the middle, and of course. The, the end, like, like the end of a string or something is whipping around the most, it's gonna go with variance one, okay? And I can now, what I can do is of course, I could go one level of refinement and this step to here is a, a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one over 32, right? So every step here is mean zero variance one over 32, okay? Uh, I'll do it again, this is one over 64, right? If I went up to, to nine, it'd be one over 512. Okay, so, uh, and so that this thing has a limit, you see. And the funny thing is, it doesn't really matter if I took a normal distribution or I took a Bernoulli or I took a dice throw. That's the funny thing that as long as you have a nice distribution with mean zero and variance that's proportional to your time step, you get the exact same limiting statistics. Okay, in other words, Brownian motion doesn't care whether you flipped a coin, whether you rolled a dice, or if you did a normal distribution, okay? And so this is an example where this limiting thing exists to mathematicians it exists just like area existed, okay? It exists because it doesn't matter how you got there. That anything you could observe about this funny looking stock market -y curve can be gotten whether you, you flipped the coins or rolled the dice. Okay, and that is sort of the interesting thing about continuous math. Okay, so, I mean, what could you do about, you know, you, this is a continuous curve where I know, this, I know the statistics at every point. Um, you can actually check that pairs, you know, what, what's, what's, the, what's the correlation between pairs of points or the covariance between multiple points. Anything you could statistically measure doesn't care in the limit with how you did it, okay? And so that's, it. in a way, that is why this, Brownian motion thing, which kind of seems sort of complicated a little bit, really is a simpler object than the Bernoulli, you know, the coin throws in, in the limit, right? It, it, I mean, 
the, but the Pascal triangle gets sort of complicated with all those n choose k's, right? But this thing in the limit sort of does really get simpler in, in a certain sense. Uh, it, this one's less familiar than area, but once you get familiar with this, if you've never seen Brownian motion before, you start to realize that the exact same thing is going on. Okay, well, I'm about to run out of time, but maybe I'll just quickly mention that, you know, the continuous limit of a, of a, of a row of Pascal's triangle is actually just this bell-shaped curve, right? And so if you actually were to, as, as you look at the, you know, if you look at this picture of David's from last time, you could see that this, the, the, this graph of Pascal's triangle, it, it wants to be a bell-shaped curve. You see, it wants to go down and spread out, right? And, uh, and you know, this, this could be done with continuous variables, right? And so at a time, at a very small time, you know, almost zero, it's a spike. And then it winds down. And this, by the way, there are a lot of physical processes that work like this in time. For example, uh, if you start cutting an onion at a certain time, right? This is, and, and then somehow measure the smell. Uh, this, this, you know, at first the onion smell is near the onion. And as time goes by, it diffuses, okay? And this is indicating sort of the strength. So, at, at certain distances as you go on. Or if you put a heater, say, if you put a heat source, right? And then you let time go by, you watch the heat spread around. Again, it diffuses. Lots of processes in, in the physical world diffuse. And here is the continuous version of, so this was this picture. Um, probably it's pointing the wrong way or whatever, but you know, I could probably turn it around. So if I, if I go plotly, which lets me turn it around then um, I could make it sort of line up maybe with Dave's picture. Yeah, so you know, you can do things like this. Uh, let's, let's, how do I do the zoom? Where's the zoom, 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 there's zoom. So yeah, so, you know, again, it's fun to play with these things. Right, so which way did this, it was, this was more the orientation where, like, it's sort of hard to do this way, um, but you get the idea. This is the continuous version of of uh, the, that Pascal triangle picture that Dave showed last time. And so this thing evolves basically through a discrete process, right? You, you, know, you sum the previous rows and, and divide by two to, to normalize, okay? And this evolves by a continuous process, which is basically the continuous limit of the same process. This involves a differential equation, okay? And so uh, if you, if you, it's a partial differential equation, uh, but it's a differential equation and that, those are the right words. And maybe the, the real thing is I'm not trying to, 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 to either scare people who have never seen differential equations or just repeat, repeat what you might already know if you've taken a differential equations class. What I want you to do is to recognize that these processes are the same. They have a different language, which might be itself sort of scary, right? We talk about taking derivatives versus, you know, taking, taking differences, we, 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 there's a whole different language to the continuous and the discrete. And, and that's sometimes a bit of a turnoff for those who are not as familiar with, with these things. And, and I'm just here to tell you that the discrete and the continuous are two sides of the same coin. All right, I've got, it's two o'clock, it's the hour here on the East Coast. So I will stop right there uh, and I'll say goodbye to the internet people. Maybe Dave can.